Welcome to Sit Heads Meditation Club. My name is John. I organize this group. Uh, Sit Heads is a sitting and social group for people interested in deep meditation practice. And if you want to hang out with us, uh, we have meetups usually on Thursdays, uh, usually on Thursday evenings where we get together, we meditate and we talk about practice. And then every now and then we'll have a guest teacher join us as well. So if you want to hang out with us, um, you can find us at sitheads.com. That's sit-heads.com. Oh, also, uh, we have a program that we run called Sitting Circles. This is for anyone who wants to meditate every day and finds that kind of hard to do, as I think many people do. So the way that it works is you basically just put in uh, your scheduling preferences when you would like to sit during the day. And then we match you with a small group of other people who want to sit at the same time. And you all commit to sit together uh, via video chat every weekday at that set time. And so it becomes sort of an accountability buddy thing. It's like having a gym buddy, right? You need to show up because you know that the other folks will be there. They got to show up because they know that you'll be there. And it is a shockingly effective way to help yourself stick to a daily meditation practice. Uh, I have been in a sitting circle since uh, July, and it is the reason that I have been sitting every day since July. You know, as so one thing about sit heads is that we don't have a set teacher, but we do have uh, visiting teachers join us from time to time. And today we are very, very lucky um, to have the, the, why don't I just stop there, Sharon Salzberg. You may have heard of her. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce Sharon, not that she needs much introduction. Uh, and then I'll sort of pass the mic to her if she wants to say hello or anything that she wants to say. And then um, we'll get started. Sharon, does that sound all right? That sounds great. Okay. Um, so Sharon Salzberg um, is one of the most, influ it must be weird to hear people talk about you like this, Sharon, but- It's quite um, strange. So get ready because it's about to happen again. I'm used to it. Um, yeah, good. Um, sorry. Sharon is one of the most influential meditation teachers alive today. Uh, she is the co-founder of, uh, I'm going to lay it on pretty thick, sorry. Uh, she co-founded the Insight Meditation Society, uh, famous IMS in Barrie, Massachusetts, which helped spark the modern Vipassana movement in the West. I think it's also pretty reasonable to say that Sharon is the person most responsible for popularizing metta or loving kindness meditation uh, in the West. Sharon has been meditating for 50 years. She has done extensive retreat. Her teachers uh, include a number of 20th century legends, the sort of people whose posters I would have up on my wall if that were a thing for meditation teachers, people like uh, the great Deepa Ma, uh, Saida Upandita, Anagarika Munindra, uh, the famous Essen Goenka, and the great Dzogchen master Tulku Ergen Rinpoche, and I believe his son, uh, Sokni Rinpoche as well. Uh, Sharon is, of course, a best-selling author of many books. They are very good books. Um, I loved Loving Kindness, which I believe was her first, and her most recent is called Real Change. So that's Sharon Salzberg. Um, Sharon, is there anything you want to say before we get started with our little conversation and then open it up to Q&A? Um, I'm happy to be here. I think you you know how to pronounce Barry, which is a very uncommon thing. So congratulations. And uh, I really like the idea of those sitting circles. I I sort of belong to a, um, an older fashioned version of that some years ago must be like eight years ago or more now. I was with a, so a group of friends, a small group of friends in someone's house. And, and the person whose house it was said, if I get up in the morning and I turn right, I'm at my computer, my desk and my computer. And if I turn left, I'm at my sitting cushion. So mostly as a support system to him, but it proved to be supportive for all of us. We formed this group, this community, which as you know, the, the Pali word for community is, is Sangha. So we called it the turned left Sangha. And what we do is every day when you've practiced, you send an email to the other four. There are only five total. You send an email to the other four and the subject line is always turned left. And if you want, you say, 
you know, turn left, it's raining in Barry, or, you know, or nothing. Um, but it's the subject line that's most important. And it's been going on like every day for all these years. And it is tremendously supportive. And there is a certain sense of responsibility, which is interesting. And, and also like any human endeavor, it brings up everything. And you have to have a kind of light touch with everything that comes up in your mind. Like for years, I had had a sitting practice every day. And so as we began this, I was always the first one to write. And then I freaked out and I thought, oh, they think I'm showing off. They think I'm like a goody goody. So I'd wait like seven hours after the sitting before I'd send the email. Um, you know, see, and sometimes people don't write and you think, where are they? How are they? You know, uh, it, it's quite interesting all in and of itself. And I think it's, uh, it's actually invaluable to have that sense of, of connection that way. That's incredibly cool that there's this uh, precedent that I didn't know Precursor, about. Precursor, yeah. Very cool. And I really like the sort of turn left, uh, just having that sort of shared uh, touch point or reference. I think that's really cool. Um, so, and, and I'm sure that when you were writing early, by the way, it could only have been helpful, right? Because then they see it and they're like, well, crap, Sharon's sad. I better, right? I better get to the cushion. I better go turn left. Um, wow, that's, that's exceedingly cool. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a short conversation, me and Sharon, which I think is a nice way to sort of uh, plant some seeds for the Q&A. And we'll do that till the hour mark. Um, we might run a little bit over, but I will endeavor to keep that to a minimum because I, your questions are much more important than mine, everybody. So then when I'm done, when we're done having our little convo, uh, we'll open it up to Q&A and I'll talk about how we'll handle that when we get to the hour mark. Does that sound okay, Sharon? Mm -hmm. All right, great. I guess I'll start with Meta um, because, I mean, I think we all know why, you know, you are very closely associated with the practice of Meta. My understanding is that in the early days of IMS, Meta was perhaps not as emphasized until the need for it became clearer. Um, to you and the and the other founders, uh, which I think is super interesting. So I guess my question is, for people who are really practicing for deep transformation or for awakening, even in the sort of classical Buddhist mode, you know, and there are people in this group, many people in this group, for whom that's the context of their practice, they really want to wake up, they want to, uh, you know, achieve what is more traditionally called stream entry, the first stage of classic awake, classical awakening in Theravada Buddhism. So I do think it is easy for quote unquote serious meditators to not take meta seriously, as mm -hmm. seriously as they should, right? And to say, well, I don't have time for that. I've got to do my sort of noting practice, my Vipassana practice. Mm -hmm. I, got to, I got to crank through the progress of insight, right? And, and so could you talk a little bit about the appropriate role of meta practice for someone who is practicing for awakening, you know, who is trying to experience insight um, and move in that direction, what role should meta play in their practice? How much of it should they do? How should they approach it? How does it integrate with, with insight or concentration practice? Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, metta means loving kindness, in case not everyone is totally conversant in Pali. Thank you. Um, you know, which is certainly possible. Um, it's not exactly, I think, that we saw the need for it, except that um, when I first started practicing, it was 50 years ago, remarkably enough. Uh, it was my first course was uh, in India in Bodh Gaya, India, and the teacher was S.N. Goenka, and it was a 10-day intensive Vipassana or insight meditation retreat. And the engine for insight is mindfulness, which we're going to talk about a whole bunch um, in a little bit. So Goenka taught this method, as many of you probably know, of kind of, we call it these days a body scan, popularized by John Kabat-Zinn, who goes in the other direction, he starts at the feet and goes up for some reason. Um, but that was basically the tool. It was three days of mindfulness of the breath at the nostrils, only at the nostrils, and then the body scan. And right at the end, Goenka did a little bit of loving kindness practice 
And it was almost like a ceremonial way of saying goodbye. It was like a ritual, but I was really struck by it. I thought, Ooh, what's that? You know? Um, and I never really had the opportunity to practice it intensively under guidance until uh, I went to Burma in 1985, when I did a three month course, a three month retreat in loving kindness with uh, my Burmese teacher, Saira Upandita. And, um, and when I, I was so, um, I, I so recognized the changes that had wrought in me and how important it was for me as a practice that I came back and started teaching it. And I would say that some of the um, objections or challenges you gave voice to I've, were right there. You know, it's just a feel good practice. It's not about enlightenment. You'll never see emptiness that way, you know? So, um, and I think it, it comes down to one's understanding of what mindfulness is and the building blocks of mindfulness because uh, mindfulness is not just noticing. It's not just being aware that you're hearing a sound or you're feeling a sensation in your body is noticing in a certain way. And so uh, one way of describing it is a quality of awareness without grasping aversion or delusion in terms of how we're relating to what's going on. You may be looking at grasping aversion or delusion, but you're not looking with grasping aversion or delusion. So um, there are a lot of implications there. We're not uh, condemning what we're feeling. We're not ashamed of it. We're not afraid of it. Um, we're not trying to push it away. We're not trying to disguise it or deny it. And any one of us at different times, it's not like we're just one way, uh, at different times may discover we're out of balance in a certain direction. Maybe we're um, very uh, judgmental and we're kind of distancing ourselves from what we're uncovering, whatever that might be, an emotion, a thought, a sensation. Or maybe we're, we have no space, we have no centeredness, we're just overcome by everything. You know, and, and those imply different balancing mechanisms in order to have that sense of presence and awareness that is mindfulness. And I think the reality for many people in the West um, with the kinds of conditioning we have, uh, there's a tremendous tendency to judge and to have aversive reactions to what may be arising in our experience. I'm somewhat famous amongst, um, and I know you know some of them, uh, the group of people who were at my first retreat, you know, who, who are still very close friends, for once having marched up to Goenka and saying to him, I never used to be an angry person before I started meditating, therefore laying blame exactly where I felt it belonged, which was on him. It was clearly all his fault. You know, and certainly I'd been hugely angry, but I hadn't been aware of it before. But when I began to see it, I didn't like it one bit, you know. So would we call that mindfulness? Not really, you know. I mean, it was an ingredient, but it, it didn't have that sense of openness and presence and interest and so on. So I, I really saw loving kindness as a key ingredient for genuine mindfulness. And without that mindfulness, there is no insight. So do some people have it naturally? Yes. Yeah. So we're not all out of balance in one direction, you know, at all times. But I just saw that, oh, this is something that is really important. And you can hear it now as people scramble, uh, which I find very amusing, you know, like people say, well, the word mindfulness sounds so cold, it sounds so clinical, you have to really call it something else. So I hear people calling it warm mindfulness or kindfulness or heartful mindfulness or loving awareness, you know, and I just call it mindfulness because uh, inevitably mindfulness has to have that kind of um, kind element, you know, or we're just crashing ourselves all the time over what we're seeing. So uh, I don't think you have to practice mind, you have, don't, I don't think you have to practice metta or loving kindness meditation formally if it doesn't appeal to you. Um, you can also practice it informally, but what is essential is that your mindfulness has that element. 
as part of it. Otherwise, it's not really mindfulness. Hmm. That's that's a really interesting way of of of, of framing it. I, I hadn't really looked at it that way as its purpose being not necessarily a corrective, but a way of making sure that your mindfulness has all the qualities. So in that sense, it, you know, for a practitioner of insight meditation, it doesn't sound to be all that different in its function, not to be so sort of cold and clinical, but it doesn't sound all that different from maybe doing formal concentration practice for an, in, would you say that's right? I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm sort of right. Well, it is a, for, it is a formal concentration. Well, practice. Okay. Touche. touche. You know, so, uh, yeah. but even aside from that, you know, there are elements like, you know, they say the Buddha taught loving kindness is the antidote to fear. And I would believe that uh, that's a handy thing to have in one's life, you know, and uh, especially if your tendency is kind of to recoil, you know, and, and to be pretty afraid. Hmm. Um, they say that the arena of the psyche that is most profoundly affected by loving kindness practice is that of intention or motivation. So it won't determine what we do, like, will I give this guy on the street a dollar or will I say no? Or, but it, it helps mold the place we are coming from as we make the decision. And so if you have largely been motivated by fear or aversion or a sense of estrangement or separation, and you do loving kindness practice, you will find that you are largely more and more motivated by a sense of connection in what you do or what you say or what you hold back from doing or saying. And so it has a lot of consequences, you know, and a lot of real life consequences, you know, but um, just in the um, particular arena of how it folds into a practice uh, yielding stream entry or enlightenment or or liberation, you know, I think it really um, does have a, a very strong effect on the kind of quality of the mindfulness. But again, you don't have to do the formal loving kindness practice in order to, to have that, you know, you may have that anyway, or you may just engender that, you know, through seeing like, whoa, I'm way out of whack, or, you know, I'm so judgmental, or uh, just through life. Yeah, that's that's very very clarifying, and I and I'll leave, um, I'll leave I'll leave some threads unpulled there because some folks in the uh, you know in uh, in the group here might want to ask more about that. Oh, I want to say one more thing actually, yes. <laughs> which just occurred to me. Um, there's there's you know teaching of the Buddha which doesn't get a lot of airtime usually, uh, which is called gladdening the mind, and it's almost like. Um, the building blocks we put in place so that when we are looking kind of strongly at suffering at, at dukkha, um, it's the right kind of looking basically, you know, cause the idea is that um, suffering is not redemptive. The point, suffering is not liberating. It's how we are relating to it. That's the whole point. And we know that from life, right? Some people have a slightly hard time and they're bitter and they're mean and other people, they just go through a lot and somehow they, they're really compassionate and they're really uh, caring about others, you know? And, and so it's how we learn to relate to that essential truth of life in Dukkha that's really important. And so the idea, the encouragement is not to just kind of throw yourself in off the deep end, but we put building blocks in place so that as we uncover things that are really uncomfortable, we don't crumble and we don't like, over identify with them and we have perspective and we can watch them change and all of that. And so that's why that whole range of practices, generosity, morality, so that we have some self-respect, we have some energy inside, we have some wherewithal uh, and loving kindness fits in there. So uh, if you then turn your attention from say a loving kindness practice, which is a concentration practice uh, to doing insight meditation, um, it's like you've done the strength training. You know, It's almost like you've got more openness, you've got more spaciousness, you've got more kindness cooking so that when you are facing 
uh, something really challenging or difficult. It's, it's in a different way. Uh, and, and on that topic, I have another question I want to ask, but I might not have time for it, that, which is okay. But um, when someone is, say they're practicing insight meditation and they're going through the stages that can be a bit hairier uh, and more difficult, um, in, the, in those situations, um, there can be a suffering that does, you're, you're right, suffering isn't liberating and it, and it really doesn't feel liberating in those moments. It can feel pretty crushing uh, or just dispiriting. Uh, and it's hard not to, my teacher would say to me, don't wilt, don't wilt in the face of it. Um, and so my question is, in those situations, is it appropriate to do, to deliberately cultivate loving kindness and to do these sorts of gladdening the mind practices, or are you dodging? Are you not letting the sort of anvil of the knowledges of suffering sort of smush you as you should in, the, in that particular phase of practice? Well, it's a little hard to say in the abstract, you know, but I don't think you're necessarily uh, in an avoidance mechanism, you know, because to be exhausted or depleted. I mean, the whole idea is balance, and that's very hard to believe. And even leaving loving kindness aside totally. Um, I said that my, my uh, loving kindness teacher was this Burmese monk, Saira Upandita, you know, in Burma. So the year before I first met him, which is when we brought him to Barry to teach, and we'd never met him before, and we'd heard he was a really wonderful teacher. So we brought him, and then he taught a three-month retreat. He arrived the day before, so it was the first time I met him. Uh, and I sat that retreat, as did many of my friends, and he was a really wonderful teacher. And he was also like extremely fierce and intense and demanding. Um, so much so that every once in a while, I think, what did we do, you know? Even though we personally had a, a really great relationship and it was a really important course for me. But um, one day we're in the meditation hall and somebody asked him, how long should I pay attention to physical pain before I move my attention to something that's easier? So that might be listening to sound, it might be something else in your body, something like that. And I thought given his personality, he was going to say, you should be with the pain until you fall over. I really did. And to my astonishment, he said, don't be with it for very long. He said, be with the pain, move your attention to something that's easier. Then maybe go back to the pain, move your attention away again. He said, it's not wrong to just be with the pain and be with the pain and be with the pain, but you'll likely get exhausted. So why not build in balance all along the way? I love the don't wilt, you know. Because that's not the point. Nothing is going to be generated from sitting there hating your experience completely and uh, despising yourself for not being able to avoid it. And it's just exhausting. So I was sitting there on the hall when he said that. And I thought, boy, if those words are coming out of his mouth, he must really think it's true. Because he was the furthest thing in the universe from somebody who would say something just to be nice, you know? Um, so think about that. Think about balance. And what do I need to do right now to help get more balance? And maybe I'm shirking from the experience. Maybe I need to come forward and hang in there or lean into it a little bit more. It's hard to say, you know, in the abstract, but I think we can tell. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll, that's helpful on a personal level also. I do think it's easy to, for some people, and I'm among them, to get sort of stuck in sort of warrior practice mode. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a form of, of, of judgment, right? As self-judgment and striving. And so it's really helpful to hear that Upandita of all people was cautious, was, was sort of advising gentleness when appropriate, right? It, when, when that contributes to balance. So thank you for that. Let's um, open it up. Does that sound okay, Sharon? Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Um, Fred, you want to kick us off? Yes, I would. Thank you. Hi, Sharon. Thank you for being here. It's really a, a great pleasure to be able to talk to you directly. Thank you. Um, yes, my question is regarding metta. Um, 
whenever I listen to talks or guided in meditations or read books about metta, um, I get a feeling like it's always only on the surface. Like um, pick someone that's not too difficult to deal with and send him good vibes. Like I'm oversimplifying, but I think you get the point. Uh, on the other end, let's say I, I, I um, do that a thousand hours and still learn something new, the next one, like it's very deep and rich, um, which is something I don't get with Meta. So mm -hmm. I guess I was just uh, wondering, like, am I missing something? Like, is this it? Um, and uh, what's at the deep end of, of Meta practice and how does one proceed to move towards that? Uh, well, again, you know, I mean, it's not a compulsory practice. It's really up to you. And I, I guess the question is, you know, do you feel intrigued enough or challenged enough to want to undertake it or not? And, and that'd be fine. Like, I certainly did. You know, I, I tried for years to find a teacher and uh, it was 14 or 15 years before I, you know, got that circumstance to go to, to, go to uh, Burma. And um Partly, you know, my response would be it is a concentration practice. And so you can undertake it as a very serious concentration practice. Uh, it has, uh, for some people's strengths, it has strengths and weaknesses as a concentration practice. And at all concentration practices in the tradition, um, with the exception of uh, being, being with the breath, being aware of the breath, and uh, that might be it, as far as I remember, um, where, you know, in the olden days, like in the Buddhist time, they were chosen for the practitioner by their teacher to create a kind of balance. So if you were very aversive or you were very frightened or, or so on, then they would, they would offer you loving kindness, even though it might be challenging. It was the opposite energy of your conditioning, or if you were full of craving or, or whatever, then it might be a reflection on death or something like that, you know? So, um, but you can undertake it as a concentration practice and that would be uh, very precise, you know, aiming your attention, connecting to a phrase. Uh, if you use phrases, not everyone uses phrases, but as an example, um, really returning your attention when your, your mind has wandered and so the end point of that would be jhanas, you know, it would be, it would be those states. Um, all along the way, you are also cultivating, and this is really why most people do it, not for deep states of concentration. You are cultivating a kind of fearlessness and a sense of connection to others. And, and uh, it's very hard to assess that practice because I've seen over and over again that the, the deepest results don't show them, they don't reveal themselves in the formal practice. They reveal themselves in, in your life. How do you speak to yourself when you've made a mistake? How do you meet a stranger? How afraid are you, you know, in some situation? Can you overcome? Like I used to be absolutely petrified of public speaking. I was incapable of speaking, you know, in front of a group. And the first retreat Joseph and I were invited to teach in this country it was a month long retreat in California. It was 1974 and a month long retreat meant 30 talks, you know, because that's the way we do um, tents of retreats is like you practice all day and there's teacher contact or Q and a, but at night there's the discourse, you know, and could not do it. So Joseph had to give 30 talks in a row and, these people were coming up and yelling at him. Why won't you let her have a voice? Why won't you let her speak? And he said, I'd be delighted, you know, if, if she would just say something, I'd have a night off, could not do it. I mean, I was petrified. And it was only through the practice of metta that I actually was able to do that. But I wouldn't, there wasn't like a breakthrough moment in my sitting. I just changed over the course of time. And it's very frustrating for people, you know, because we look to that sitting Maybe you sit every day for, well, you people might sit more than 20 minutes. I don't know, but, you know, you sit every day and it, it's not within that period that you will see, oh, I'm, you know, I'm different, but you will be different. And so um, 
And in terms of like the mildly difficult person, which you sort of refer to, um, you know, sending them good vibes. It was like, um, it was funny when you said that, cause I'd just been thinking that, uh, not the good vibes part, but when I said the instruction from Upandita, like uh, leave the very difficult physical sensation or, or whatever, and then come back to it. That's a very unpopular instruction. I have found that because uh, many, many of us have that kind of heroic mentality. Like I've got to break through, I've got to hang in there with the hardest part or else it doesn't count. It's just a superficial exercise. And the only other meditation instruction in 46 years of teaching that is as unpopular is if you're offering loving kindness to a difficult person, don't start with the most horrible person in your life who has just behaved so terribly, you know, that it's unthinkable. Um, build up to it slowly. And so that is also a very unpopular meditation instruction. It doesn't seem real enough or gritty enough or something. Um, so it's up to you, you know, if you want to make that experiment or not, it, it really is up to you. Uh, but if you are going to make the experiment, I would both look for the a precision of concentration practice and also just the effect in your life of, of greater loving kindness. Thank you. That, that's even better than what I expected. <laughs> Thank <you very> much. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Sharon. Eve, would you like to go ahead and ask? Hi, Sharon. Thank you for coming. Um, I, uh, I am, haven't done a lot of meta, but I uh, think it's very important. And, um, and I would like to read more about it, learn more about it. Um, I don't find it very difficult to send loving kindness to people who are neutral or people I care about or people that I have trouble with, but I find it very difficult to do it towards myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and have a little bit of an unfortunate habit of having more of a destructive relationship towards myself. Um, and I keep trying to slow things down so it doesn't happen so quickly that I can't like get, get any space in there to be able to do something with it. Um, you know, to be able to shift uh, that relationship to myself. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had any tips or suggestions or something you could share about that. Thanks. I do. And, you know, the first thing I would say is you are not alone. You know, this is very common. And um, the underlying principle of the flow of the classical practice, um, where we first send loving kindness to ourselves, then a benefactor or someone who's inspiring to us or has been good to us, then a friend, then a neutral person, then a difficult person, and then all beings everywhere not all in one session, because it's too much, but over the course of time, um, the underlying principle of that sequence is said that we're meant to do it in the easiest way possible. So the supposition is that we are the easiest person of all, because we're first. And it's so clearly untrue, you know, for, for many of us in, in this time with our cultural conditioning or whatever. Um, so that was always a little bit funny, you know, like, uh, so, one thing I would say is, um, well, actually the first thing I'd say is what I had just said, which is you may see changes, but not in your formal sitting, you know? And I mean, certainly that was the case for me. And uh, one of my signature stories about loving kindness actually came in that interim period where I had not yet gone to Burma, but I was very intrigued by the practice. And that was the first month that we opened up the Insight Meditation Society, which is just through the woods so over there. Um, because we had a month with no programming. And so those of us who were here decided that we would sit ourselves, we would do, do our own retreat. So I thought, hey, you know, I've got a month. I've wanted to do loving kindness practice. By then I knew how to do it, you know, like start with yourself and you go through this cycle and so on. So I'll just, I'll just do loving kindness practice. And so the first week I just offered loving kindness to myself and I felt absolutely nothing. 
it was like a completely dreary week. And then something happened to one of our friends or acquaintances in Boston so that several of us had to suddenly leave the retreat. So I was getting ready to leave the retreat. I was up in one of the bathrooms and I dropped this big jar of something and it just went like down on the tile floor and shattered and the stuff went everywhere. And I remember the first thought that came up in my mind was, you are really a klutz, but I love you. And I thought, look at that, you know, you could have given me anything in the course of the week. And I could have not have honestly said something was happening, but something was happening. Um, and so I know it's frustrating and it takes a lot of patience, but that's how it will actually evolve. So that's the first thing. And then, you know, I always say switch the order. Let's go back to the original principle. Don't start with yourself if that's going to be like a big struggle, but include yourself somewhere. You know, and people say things to me like, um, I didn't offer loving kindness to myself until I was doing loving kindness for all beings everywhere. And then I would like pop up, like a pop up ad in the computer, like, hey, me too, you know, um, and have fun. Uh, use active imagination, use reflection, whatever people offer loving kindness to themselves as a child or loving kindness to themselves. I had a friend who was maybe in her forties at the time. And she began imagining herself as like a 75 year old and offering herself loving kindness. And um, <clears throat> what the text would say, and especially about a difficult person is um, imagine that person as an infant of those around, imagine that person dying because no matter what we all have to let go of everything at some point. And, and we extrapolate from that, you know, like, is there a way you can imagine that difficult person so that you actually can do the practice? And people say things like, I remember one person said to me, I imagine my difficult person on this island like they had food, I wasn't trying to starve them, but no boat, no bridge. There was zero way they could get to me. And then I could do the loving kindness. And so with ourselves as well, because you are now the difficult person for yourself. You know, is there a way you can use active imagination and just kind of be creative and have fun? And the measure is that you can do the practice, not that you have some great wave of enormous love, you know, in the conventional sense. And, Thank you. Those are terrific suggestions, and that helped me connect some dots there too. So mm -hmm. I really great. Appreciate that. Thanks, Eve. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Ryan had a question. Ryan, do you want to ask Sharon? Hi there, Sharon. Um, so I've read a lot of your books. Uh, really appreciate a lot of your writing. I read your um, your Real Change book. Um, and I, and I liked it, but I also don't feel like I was really changed by it. <laughs> <laughs> Try loving kindness. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, uh, I've always struggled with a lot of like political hate and, um, and just like uh, feeling like you're making a change. In the Diamond Sutra, um, there's this phrase that uh, the Buddha says that we need to practice generosity without relying on signs. Um, do you have any insight into like what that means? No, uh, I I don't since uh, the Diamond Sutra is from another tradition, is but it? I can guess. Okay. You know, like right. I don't really know about the Diamond Sutra, which is you know uh, like a Mahayana text, and so right. But you know, I think if we were trying to assess generosity, um, it would be like first of all looking at the motivation because generosity can look the same on the surface, you know, one act mm -hmm. and another act, and they could be coming from totally different places. And so we use mindfulness to really get closer to what our motivation actually is. You know, like if I picked up um, this cup, which someone sent me, which people are taking to sending me cups with things I often say on them. <laughs> this one says, truly, don't worry about it, which is one of my meditation instructions, you know, like, right your mind wanders truly don't worry about it which i guess i say yeah. a lot so um if i were to offer you this cup of tea let's say it's full of tea 
I could be coming from anywhere in making that offering. Maybe I like you and I want you to have it, or uh, maybe I see you have a water bottle and I want to get the water bottle in exchange for the cup, or uh, maybe I don't like you and I think it's like really bitter and awful, but you're not going to be in a position to not drink it, you know? And it's all the same. It looks exactly the same on the surface, but it's coming from a totally different place. So, you know, uh, and we also don't know how it'll be received. And whether that's the cup or a gift or a smile or a thank you, or, you know, we have no control over how it's received. And so um, the fulfillment of the act has to come from somewhere else. If it's coming from how it's received, we're sunk. Right. You know, cause maybe Good you're point. like in a terrible mood and, and I hand you the cup of tea and the, from the best possible motivation, you couldn't care less. Or maybe you just, found that you won the lottery, you know, you couldn't care less about this cup of tea. And that's something I have no control over, but it's usually what we base our whole sense of worth on. Right. You know, like he didn't smile. He didn't thank me for the tea. It's like, you know, um, so that, that's all kind of interesting around generosity and, right. uh, and you're yeah. right. Of course, you know, it's not just material. It's, it's all kinds of things, you know, it's listening, it's paying attention. It's, it's whatever. Yeah. Well, they also say, you know, in the Theravada <laughs> tradition that when the Buddha was talking to lay people, he would always start with generosity. Mm -hmm. This is in the lines of what I was talking about before of gladdening the mind. Like if you're doing kind of preparatory practices, which later become, it's funny, it's very cyclical. It's like they're the preparatory practices, but they become the manifestation of the free mind, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're kind of going round and round and round and round. Um, then generosity, he would always start with generosity because as he put it, everyone has something to give. Even yeah. if you've got nothing materially, you can smile, you can thank somebody. You can pay attention to them. There's some really boring people in the world, you know? <laughs> and we would really rather not be engaged in listening, but here we are. It's an act of generosity. And, uh, you know, so... Um, cultivating it is is really a, a tremendous strength and ironically it does become the manifestation of of a free mind so um and then the book real change um was very interesting to write you know because um the whole text uh was turned in before the pandemic that's true yeah. so uh when a friend of mine was reading it um he uh, he said he liked the book, but he kept reading the examples and thinking, that's what made you anxious, you know? Like, mm -hmm. oh, wait till you see what's coming. So then I went back to the publisher because they delayed publication. And I asked for permission to write a preface. So the preface is the only part that was written, uh, you know, after I was here and, you know, home and or after people were living, you know, kind of more extreme situations out and uh and that was a very interesting process you know like but i you know when i look back at the book i'm really grateful that there were sections on grief in there and sections on remembering to take in the joy and changing anger into courage and so on and one of the most interesting things for myself in that process of writing it was almost like what we were just talking about before because i'd meet these people who were activists who um, really had to come to a profound sense of their own innate worth in order to go forward and, and engage in the way they did. Like I think of the woman um, who was very involved in the striking fast food worker movement where, uh, you know, they were striking for $15 an hour minimum wage and the right to unionize. And many of them, you know, their own families were saying, don't do it, you know, don't make waves, don't, don't um, stand out, you know, you have virtually nothing now, you'll really have nothing. And, but, you know, they thought people should be treated better because we all have a kind of innate worth, which is certainly a Buddhist concept. So there was a kind of love for oneself that fueled a lot of activism. That was very interesting for me. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ryan, Sharon. Um, B, 
Bijan, would you like to ask your question? Yes, please. Thank you. Hi, um, <laughs> Sharon, thank you so much. Um, so I have a question. So in terms of most meditation practice, whether it's insight or concentration, it's very personal based. Uh, metta is the only one which very much feels relational uh, based. And I was curious of, um, because of that, there brings a lot of, you don't really know a real person or a person maybe fully as well as you know yourself, you can't read their mind. And so it feels like oftentimes what you are doing in the meta practice feels like the, the conception of another person um, and meditating. So I was, and, and that feels like um, related to a lot of concepts of don't conceptualize, don't, um, and, uh, don't, don't hold on to stories and things like that. So I was curious if, if there was a advice you had about how to balance these two things. How do I not create a story of another person in my mind while at the same time being able to hold and relationally like feel like I am connecting to another person and not just saying like, oh, this is just a conception of my mind of another person. I'm not actually knowing them or, or relating to them. Um, well, there are a few things. One is I think it's important to accept it as a different methodology. We're actually doing something different in doing metta than in doing insight meditation. And that's okay if you want to do something different, you know? Uh, so it is conceptual in the sense that it's relational, you're right. And, you know, people object sometimes to the use of language, like, may you be happy, may you be peaceful. And I say, this is how we speak. This is how human beings speak. This is how the Buddha sp spoke. You know, we don't say may that psychophysical process of constantly changing elements coming and going, you know, arising and passing away, be happy. You know, it's not, that's not how we speak. And so, um, you know, one way of formulating it is relative and absolute truth. And that, uh, you know, relative truth is how things work. It's like, if you're kind, there are consequences to that. If you're mean, there are consequences to that. And if you cultivate, loving kindness or you behave ethically, there are consequences to that. That's the world, you know, as, as we find it. And that's different than everything is empty, you know, and they both are true, right? They both coexist. And uh, if you come down too much on the side of one and not both, then you're lost somehow, you know, uh, there's gotta be both. Um, and so that's, you know, the languaging and all that. You don't want to really do intensive story making in loving kindness, which is extremely tempting uh, because these are real beings and um, relationships are complicated. You know, so even uh, offering loving kindness to a benefactor, it's not uncommon for people to say, well, I was offering loving kindness to the benefactor and everything was going swimmingly. And then I remembered, oh, there was that one time when I called you and you weren't there for me. Maybe you're not my benefactor. Maybe you're my difficult person. And um, as the Dalai Lama would say, quoting Shanti Deva, this great Tibetan sage, enemies become friends, friends become enemies. Life is molten, it's always changing. And so the categories are kind of an artificial structure just so we have a structure in the unfolding of the practice, but they're not absolute truth. Um, it's very possible to call someone to mind and have the list of everything they need to do. Like you should get a new apartment in New York. I think that, you know, then you'd be a lot happier. And then how are you gonna pay for that? Well, maybe you need that second job, you know, and it's just like a long, long, long list. So it's important to remember it's a concentration practice and, and that will help while it remains conceptual, because that's just its nature, it will help with that kind of endless story making, you know, tendency, which is something to really guard against in loving kindness practice, because it's, it's so easy um, to just go off, you know, as you call someone to mind. And um, so you do have to be careful, I think, about that. Uh, 
but it will remain conceptual because that's its nature. Reminds me of uh, just being vigilant for the hindrances of just kind of like being able, coming back to mindfulness, as you say, the engine of, of meditation. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Sharon. I really sure. appreciate it. Thanks, Bijan. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so I have uh, a question that uh, a questioner who wishes to remain anonymous. So I'll just go ahead and ask it. Uh, this is related to Fred's question. So that was the first question uh, that, that you fielded. To the extent that one can use meta either single-handedly or largely on its own to achieve awakening, what does that path, especially in the mid to later stages, look like? Does she have any books or other resources that expound on this? Um... I am more used to thinking of loving kindness and insight meditation supporting one another. You know, to singularly use loving kindness as a path would be interesting, you know, um, because it's not really designed to highlight um, things like the truth of change. You know, you would have to bring that in, even if not in a studied sort of way, you know, but as um, I think it's, it would largely be reflective, you know, like you would do these reflections, like as you are uh, one of the basic insights or, or foundational insights into selflessness or anatta, for example, is realizing we cannot control what arises in our minds. However fervently we wish to never be afraid again or to stop grieving or whatever, you cannot control it. We can influence it, you know, we can learn that if I watch 15 sad movies in a row, I'm gonna be in a really bad way. You don't have to watch 15 bad movies in a row. We obviously have that ability to affect conditions, but not to decide like, I'll never be afraid again, or I've grieved long enough because when conditions come together for something to arise, it will arise. And so, um, you know, you may be doing loving kindness and uh, you may have the thought with a very sharp feeling like, um, for God's sake, get a new apartment, you know, like you're, you're miserable where you are. And you didn't ask for that thought. and uh, you may freak out about it, but rather than freaking out about it, you can attach a little reflection like, look at that, can't stop what arises in your mind. And then it becomes like a little anatta reflection. So I think there's a way of doing it. Mostly the kind of insight that comes has to do with, it's a kind of interconnection. It's realizing uh, in a very deep, deeply felt way, like people really do want to be happy. We do want a sense of belonging. We want a sense of having a home somewhere in this body, in this mind, on this planet. And look at all the myths we believe and all the lies that have been generated that we absorb and the delusion that we have about where happiness is to be found. And you feel the poignancy of that. You feel the universality of that wish to be happy. You feel the vulnerability we all have. I mean, look at how we've just spent more than a year, you know, and it's like, I wasn't planning on being Barry, you know, I haven't, I'm paying rent in New York city, as a matter of fact, you know, and, uh, you know, as I told you, I think I got back, I spent February, 2020 in California. I got back to New York, March 2nd, 2020, <coughs> went up to Kripalu and taught a, retreat in an airless room with 200 people with my friend Krishnadas, which meant singing, uh, somehow survived, went back to New York for like four days and decided I really need to leave. It's just so tense here. I thought I was coming here for two weeks. You know, life is like that actually all the time, but usually not so universal and not so dramatic, but it's so fragile. And you realize things like that in, in the course of opening to yourself and to others. And so uh, 
it's not like it's devoid of insight, you know, even in the classical sense, but it's not designed to really point us toward truths like change and so on. So um, I'm more used to seeing that kind of combo uh, than anything. And it works well as a combo. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so let's see. Cher, if you're still here, which I think you are, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, hi, hi, Sharon. Um, so I have been dealing with a lot of um, impatience and agitation and uh, difficulty sitting still and difficulty continuing my meditation technique during my meditation sessions. And um, I think part of it is probably just due to to um, phone addiction and internet addiction and just wanting constant stimulation and just, you know, it's, it's a reflex to reach for, reach for my next stimulus. Um, and before I know it, I'm already on my phone before I even knew that I stopped meditating. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if this is exactly a meta related question, but maybe um, you could give me some pointers on how to how to settle in a little bit more or maybe meta towards myself could possibly improve the situation or, you know, just being more practical and maybe just having my phone in a different room when I meditate or, you know, I don't know if you have any practice suggestions uh, related to that. Uh, yeah. One of those sitting circles might be kind of punishing, but it might be really good. Um, yeah, no, I think that was an interesting suggestion about your phone. I think you also have to, um, you know, not not get too extreme in terms of what you're demanding of yourself. It's like, there's nothing sacred, honestly, about sitting for an hour. You know, it may be that uh, you would get a lot more out of 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, than having this idea like, I talked to, um, it was actually Richie Davidson, um, who's you know, a very noted neuroscientist studying meditation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this was a few years ago. And he said to me, uh, they were finding that seven to nine minutes a day would actually change your brain. So that's, that's notable, measurable changes, you know? And then uh, just this last year, I was on a panel uh, for Oxford University, and I have another neuroscientist friend who was on the panel. Her name is Amishi Josh. She's at the University of Miami. And I quoted Richie, and I could see on the screen, she had this really funny look on her face. And, and I said, okay, Amishi, what do you think? And she said, well, my lab found that 12 minutes a day, three to four <laughs> times a week would change your brain. So obviously, first of all, nobody knows. I also don't know that I would forever try to go for the bare minimum, but nobody is saying seven hours a day is what you need to do uh, in order to have some measurable changes. So um, I also told her, uh, knowing myself, I don't think three to five minutes, three to five times a week would work for me because I'm the kind of person, if that was my model, it would be Monday. And I think I'll start Wednesday. And then it was Wednesday and I think I'll do three times on Saturday, then it'd be done. I'd never do it, but every day is every day. So find yeah. out what will work for you. Just figure it out, you know, and don't make it too extreme and then really do it. And that's the beginning, you know, of, of breaking through that kind of resistance. You also might consider, I don't know if you do loving kindness practice, um, but something that is like loving kindness or a body scan uh, will actually channel some of that restless energy where if you're just trying to say, sit and be with the breath, it'll feel more like a battle, you know, but loving kindness is more active. And so some of that energy will go into the phrases and the visualization and, and the body skin is the same thing because you're moving your attention throughout your body. So, you know, experiment with different Yeah. I sensed that I was fighting against the restlessness um, 
and I sensed that there was sort of a battle. So that's, yeah, thanks for um, pointing that out because yeah, maybe bringing some, uh, some meta to the restlessness could, could help me out a little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Cher. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Sean, go ahead and ask your question if you like. Oh, uh, sure. Hi, Sharon. So, um, question was about, uh, like, I guess meta is like one of the four, like, uh, Brahma Bihar Bihars, I think. And people talk a lot about meta, but it seems like they don't talk as much about the other ones. And I was curious about like what your experience is with practicing the other ones or like why people are really into meta, but don't seem to be into the other mm -hmm. three. I don't remember what they all are, but like mm -hmm. I had personally messed around with like compassion meditation and it seemed like really powerful, like thinking about like, you know, other people's like desire to not suffer is like my desire to not suffer, things like that. But yeah, it seems like nobody like, or people just don't talk about it nearly as much as meta. I was curious about your thoughts about that. Yeah, we, we don't, you're right. Um, but we could, you know, uh, especially, I mean, they're all connected to one another and especially the first three, you can feel the sort of emotional resonance. The first is meta or loving kindness, which is like a, a profound sense of connection. And it doesn't even have to be emotional. You know, we think of it as some gushy state, like very warm and it doesn't have to be that way, but it's like a deep knowing that our lives have something to do with one another. And it, it's very real. It actually, um, you know, the uh, um, practice actually brings about that realization. And sometimes people despair too, because it's not that emotional always. It's just, maybe it's a sense of inclusion or recognizing someone's humanity or something like that. You know, and we want it to be emotional and it, it's not. So that's just something to keep in mind. The second is compassion, which is very close to loving kindness and is often used in English just interchangeably, but it has a slightly different flavor in the Buddhist psychology more. Like if, if Metz is based on recognizing everybody wants to be happy, compassion is more based on recognizing that everyone is actually so vulnerable. Like, you know, that life is so fragile and even though we don't all suffer in the same degree for sure, but it's so changeable and, um, and it's got a just different feeling tone to it. And uh, the third is sympathetic joy or happiness in the happiness of others, instead of feeling so jealous or um, freaked out because someone else is, is happy. You actually feel joy in their happiness and, um, I've had teachers say that of the four, uh, sympathetic joy can be the most difficult for a lot of people to actually be happy for someone else because we have to confront a lot of assumptions like that happiness is a limited commodity in this world and the more someone else has, the less there's gonna be for me or I have nothing and I will forever. And you, you have everything and you will forever. So there are a bunch of problems with that. Of course, nothing is forever. And um, it's unlikely I have absolutely nothing. I may have nothing much I'm appreciating. It's also unlikely you have everything, you know? So we have to unpack a lot to kind of come to sympathetic joy, but we can. And then the fourth is equanimity, which in this context, equanimity means the voice of wisdom. It's the balance that comes from wisdom. It's not indifference or withholding, it's really wisdom. So it's like compassion might say, I will do everything I can to try to ease your pain or make a difference in your situation. And wisdom accompanies that and tells us, and I'm not in charge of the universe. I will do everything I can and I don't have control. I don't have control over your choices. I don't have control over the situation. It doesn't take away from compassion, it adds to it. Because then we're not so frustrated and demanding, like I told you what to you know, do, you're not doing it, you're not getting better or whatever it is. Um, so it's loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. 
we say equanimity is always there um, or it's not really loving kindness. It's not really compassion. It's more like, it's not a freely given gift. It's got strings attached, you know, like please me, um, thank me, something like that. So equanimity is always there. And then uh, they each have their own phrases if you wanna adopt them as unique practices. They're very similar, but um, you know, they're also a little bit different. And more commonly what people do, because it, it can be confusing to always be changing phrases, is they use one vehicle like loving kindness. And if you are specifically offering loving kindness, say to a friend who's doing really well, it becomes like a sympathetic joy meditation, even though you're using the same old phrases or you're offering loving kindness to a friend who's really not doing so well, it becomes a compassion meditation. Uh, so you can do it either way. And what you're noticing is very true. You know that most people just use the loving kindness phrases, but you could just say, well, you know, I really want to devote myself to compassion or sympathetic joy or something like that. Great, thanks. That was really helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sharon. Um, let's see, Stephen. Stephen, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank you, John. Thanks, Sharon, for answering these formidable questions for us. Um, I have one that's hopefully relatively easy to answer. Um, I started doing a like meta practice a couple of years ago after a teacher mentioned having had a relationship uh, with her daughter actually heal from doing meta practice. And um, I started incorporating it and I found over time that it, I often find it easier to kind of recount moments of gratitude I had for experiences in the past with the person or certain qualities or like virtues or just things they've said. And I'm wondering if, with meta practice is that like is that fine to infuse gratitude into a meta practice can it have any drawbacks or like you know is that could that be like projection or like holding on to qualities um so i, I was just wondering if you could speak on that like what you think about having gratitude as part of the meta practice i think it could be great i mean in some ways uh, going back to sympathetic joy, you know, it's, it's one of the um, precursors, you know, because if you get into that state of like, I have nothing and I will forever, it's really hard to be happy for someone else. You know, you feel so depleted and not enough and all of that. But if you have a practice of gratitude, then uh, you can actually be happy for somebody else. And a lot of people don't like the idea of a gratitude practice. They, they feel like as a human being, you'll then like settle for crumbs, you know, like you're taught to just be grateful for nothing. And, and here you are. And, and, but I, I think it actually, both scientifically, that's not true, I'm told. And it doesn't function that way. It has us feel, you know, less um, oblivious and less desperate and you know, it actually gives us a lot of inner strength. And so it also, it's the closest model I know for the way loving kindness practice works. And this is in contrast to mindfulness practice, which is meant, it's designed to help us come closer and closer to our experience. But there are other practices and loving kindness is one, gratitude is one, which are what I call a stretch. It's like, we realize I have a certain rut of paying attention in a certain way, like thinking of myself at the end of the day and only thinking about the mistakes I made and the crummy things I did, you know, or I didn't show up in the way I had hoped. And so we stretch, you know, and say anything else happened today, like, you know, anything to be grateful for, any good within me, or, you know, we wish ourselves well. And so a lot of people don't like the idea of loving kindness practice because it feels they're afraid that it's going to be phony, you know, that they're going to force themselves, try to force themselves to feel something they don't, but it's really not like that. It's a stretch in how we pay attention and gratitude is the closest 
corollary. So I always use it as an example, like, uh, you know, so many people say that one of the most healing things any of us can do is keep a gratitude journal, like write down three things every night that we're grateful for. And I always say, well, first of all, it doesn't have to be something grandiose. You know, it can be that you're breathing. This is a good thing. Um, and I always say, as is true, this doesn't come naturally to me. You know, my personal conditioning, my familial conditioning, my cultural conditioning is such that I'm so much more likely to come to the end of the day and think about what I can complain about. You know, I didn't show up in the way that I wanted to, and I didn't say that right. And uh, that person disappointed me. And, and, you know, back in the days when I was traveling incessantly, it was always an airline. You know, there's always a phone service. And that's just where my mind goes. So it takes intentionality to say, what else happened today? You know, and actually kind of broadening or stretching in that way. And that's the way those practices work. And uh, it's not moving to something phony. It's moving to something overlooked, usually. Thanks. Yeah, that, that really resonated, I guess. Just keep trying to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Morgan, do you want to ask your question? Hi, yes. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, Sharon. Also, it's really great to be able to meet you and talk to you. I'm wondering how meditation uh, can help us figure out our own needs, what we're needing in a moment. You know, if we're used to uh, living a certain way, we just become used to um, our, our lifestyle and it, it becomes obscured. I think insight happens on lots of different levels, you know, and they're the universal levels that we can talk about. Everything's changing all the time or we're all interconnected and those are genuinely true. And then there are lots of levels that are kind of personal. We see how certain emotions work in us and you know, an example I use all the time is like when I've sat and just hung out mindfully with my fear. Um, there are certain ways of doing that. You know, first of all, we have to kind of pivot, which is one of the first points of mindfulness. It's like if we have a strong emotion, we usually get fascinated by or fixated on the object. Like if you really want a new car, um, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking, do I, what paint color do I want? What kind of features do I want? You don't usually turn your attention to what does it feel like to want something so badly? But that's what we do in the meditation. You know, what am I angry at? But what is anger? What is it? What does it feel like in my body? What What's the sort of mood? And we see, you know, these feelings are very complex. It's not just one thing. Uh, if you're looking at anger, you may see fear, you may see sadness, you may see all kinds of things. So what I've said about looking at my own fear in just this way is, unlike the world's pronouncement that we're afraid of the unknown, which of course is also true, I'm usually afraid because I think I do know and it's going to be really bad. And I'm just spinning all these stories about how terrible it's going to be. And uh, you know, I'm going to go back to my apartment in New York City and I'm going to turn on the faucet. I haven't been there since November, you know, and I'm going to get Legionnaire's disease because I heard you can get Legionnaire's disease from water, you know, and it's just like, but when I remind myself in the middle of all that, that I don't know, then I feel relief and I feel space. It's like, hey, I don't know. Um, so part of the insight comes from just paying attention to the whole range of what might arise and say in a, in a, a, and a sitting practice and not resenting any of it, you know, because all of it can be revealing of something. And there's also, um, there are ways in which we play, which, you know, maybe a more direct response to what you were saying, if you sense certain habits, uh, even if it's a vague sense and you sit with that and maybe bring up the kind of scenario that tends to elicit a certain feeling. So for example, I have a friend who felt that um, she was often in an uncomfortable situation at work where she was doing other people's jobs or, you know, it, it was, and it seemed to her that she really 
was maybe the kind of person who couldn't really say no to things. And so what she did in her meditation was she purposely brought up those kind of scenarios where she might be asked something actually inappropriate and she would say yes. And she studied what was happening in her body, like this kind of panic, you know, very viscerally coming up, like maybe they won't like me, you know, whatever it was. And usually those physical responses are quicker than the mental cognition of like, oh, I better say yes, because so she studied those and those became her feedback um, system so that when she was back at work and she was asked that very kind of question, she would feel that panic in her body. And that became her signal to say, I'll have to get back to you about that. She couldn't quite bring herself to say no, but she knew that was a sign that she needed some space. And then she could say no once she had some space. And so this is what we, uh, you can kind of play with that, you know, uh, in your meditation and just imagine certain situations and, and see what it elicits. And then, uh, and always with kindness, you know, like rather than judgment and, and see what kind of insight that lends itself to. I got it. So using our emotions as sort of a compass yeah. for yeah. what we need. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks, Sharon. So um, we're pretty close to the hour mark. So I think we're going to wrap up here, if that's okay with you, Sharon. Does that sound all right? Yeah, I just want to comment on something that somebody put in the chat. Yes. Which uh, was about uh, if you have kind of a version for uh, formal practice, um, to practice what we, we sometimes call short moments many times, like don't freak out because you're not formally practicing. Practice drinking a cup of tea mindfully or walking from room to room uh, mindfully. And there are actually studies. I know Barbara Fredrickson at the University of North Carolina uh, did some of them that show that actually has an effect. You know, that's not, not nothing. Uh, the problem with not having a formal practice is that we get so busy and it's so crazy and so pressured, like, are we really going to remember, you know, to drink that cup of tea mindfully? And so that period of formal practice is also like a little period of strength training, but I, I would really honor those short moments that we can just take a breath or, uh, remember to, to be present in what we're doing. Thanks for that reminder, Sharon. Um, and I think that in this group, there can sometimes be, you know, there's sort of a focus on deep practice and all that that entails. And it's really helpful to be reminded of these short moments available to us throughout the day, these seemingly mundane experiences that absolutely do add up. So thank you for sort of redirecting us to that. Um, and thank you just generally. This was such a wonderful night uh, with you. So thanks for all um, your advice and insights. Well, thank you. You're doing great stuff. It's really wonderful to tune in. Thanks, Sharon. And thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a good night. <laughs>